All right, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Give it a minute, let a couple of people get on here. Julie Rawlings, David and Michelle. Shane Stokes, how you doing? Amber, Carl, Chucky, right. Femi, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. All right, sorry, I'm a little late. I know I was gonna be on here at four. Um, just had to take care of something. But um, so I'm really excited about this message. I've actually have had this message probably for like, I think three or four months and I've just been waiting for the right time just kind of waiting for when I felt like okay now's the time to do it and um, and I thought it was perfect sermon to do right before the start of this new program um, let's talk prophecy that the, the new uh, the program I'm going to be starting tomorrow night and um, uh, it's as you see on here. It's titled "Prepare the Way of the King," and what I want to get into is correlating with "Prepare the Way of the Lamb," or or what John talks about, and I'm going to get in those scriptures and and take how all of this ties in what we're doing what we're living, how we're living, and how everything of what we are supposed to be doing is to usher in and prepare the way of the king for what we are awaiting to bring in the end of this age and to enter into the age of millennial reign, to enter into the transformation of the mortal to immortal, the corrupt to incorruptible, and um, like like we read in First Corinthians 15. So as usual, I will put in once the message is over, I will post the scripture verses um, afterwards in the comments section, so everybody will have them. So uh, right off the bat, so I'm gonna blow the fire and pray. <laughs> come to you in prayer in the precious name of Yehovah Yeshua. Abba, we thank you for your Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. And we thank you for everything of what this day means. And Abba, as I get into this message, I pray and I ask in the name of Yeshua that you would please speak through me, that everything that I share from your word, everything that I believe that is on my heart to share in this message, Abba, let it be from you and you alone. Let your truth come forth and that, let nothing, Abba, if there be anything that would come from my mouth that is not your truth, let it not leave my lips. But Father, that your word and your truth be presented here to bring conviction, to bring hope, to bring encouragement, to bring boldness. And what everything here is to represent, what it means to all of us. And just thank you and praise you for everyone who is joining with me right now live, everyone listening, and anyone who, who listens to this later on. And we just ask this and pray this in Yehovah Yeshua. Amen. All right, so right out the gate, I want to start off with John 1 to set the stage of this. So John chapter 1, starting at ver uh, verses 19 through 23. 
Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Eliyahu? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of Yehovah, as the prophet Yeshayahu said. Now, right off the bat, I want to talk about how he came to make straight. And in Isaiah chapter 40, um, we're going to also cover those. I like the little more detail. Of course, John was, is, was just, you know, touching the, the essential, the most essential verse there. But verse 40, or chapter 40 of Isaiah, verses 3 through 5. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yehovah, make straight in the desert a highway for our Elohim. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be straight, made straight, the tough, the rough places smooth. The glory of Yehovah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Yehovah is spoken. Mishpahad, this was a preparation for Yeshua to come as the, as the Lamb. But it is also the same preparation to usher in the King. First he came as a suffering servant, then he returns as the roaring lion, as king of kings. And I'm going to get into that more in a minute. But what I want to, what I want to get into and encourage you on, Mishpaha, is to understand the, the vitality and, and the, the importance of how our mindset needs to be set that it's, it's easy for us to get caught up and just I need this, or I need that, or whatever, or help me here. We're always praying, Father, bless my finances, bless our home, bless my marriage. And that's good. We need to pray that. But there's one thing that needs to stand above the rest. It is what we are all declaring, Maranatha, come quickly. Come quickly, Adonai. Come quickly and, and, and deliver us out of this insanity <laughs> because that's exactly what we are living in a world that's becoming greater and greater in its wickedness and perversion a world that is being released to a reprobate mind a debased mind a hardened heart it wants this very much like we see it when when in, in jeremiah and and other places where israel said do not tell us what Yehovah has spoken, but tell us what we want to hear. Tell us that we will be prosperous and tomorrow will be like today and we can go and drink and be merry. They actually rejected the truth of what was to be spoken to them and said, lie to us and tell us what we want to hear. That same mentality is today. People who claim to be of the body, people in the churches and the Messianic congregations, the Hebrew roots and, and Judaism and all of them, just tell us everything's going to be good. Tell us we're going to have a revival. Tell us how things are going to prosper for us this new year and, and our best life now and all this other nonsense. But don't tell us that judgment is coming. Don't tell me that I need to quit sinning. Don't tell me that I have to keep the commandments. Don't tell me blah, 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 blah. And that is the mentality and that is the heart of the majority of those who claim to be of Yah. But when our heart needs to be, Father, please come quickly, send your son to come and restore the two houses of Israel, to restore his bride unto himself, 
Come quickly and transform us. Come step on the Mount of Olives. Bring us into the entrance of millennial reign and usher in the time and the age of Messiah for a thousand years and his rule on the earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is what our mentality needs to be. This is where we have to be on a constant level in heart and mind and spirit, physically, mentally, emotionally, and above all else, spiritually, that we are focused on to prepare the way of the King, to be that and to be those who Yah calls to be a part of that in these last days. Amen. Um, so second, let's go to Genesis 14. Okay, well, come on. Genesis 14, verse 18. Now, I want to I want to give a picture. Anthony and I taught on this a couple weeks ago about Malach Yehovah, uh, the angel Yehovah. And, and the more accurate, correct translation of that is the priest and king Yehovah. And how this has been established since before the, the age, before the foundation of the earth and everything. And I'll lead into that more explaining that. But first, I want to get uh, set the scriptures here. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of Elohim Most High. All right, I'm going to touch on that in a second. So, going with that is Hebrews seven eleven through twenty eight. But before I read that, I want to read this. Yah was supposed to be king over Israel when they went into the promised land. But they rejected him and insisted that a man be king over them. So Yah took a Benjamite called Saul, Shaul, and made him king over Israel. And Yah even told Israel, or told Samuel to tell Israel, you have rejected him, therefore all this calamity is going to come upon you. He gave them what they wanted. And, 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 what, and even told them before it was finalized, this is what's going to happen since you seek a man to be head over you instead of Yehovah. And they said, oh, cool, we'll take it. We'll, we'll deal with it. And they dealt with it, all right. But what, they, but what they were forgetting was that this is, was, and forever will be Melchizedek, two Hebrew words, Zedek and Melech, king of righteousness. He has always been king, king of righteousness, king of Salem, and what later became Yerushalayim. Everything from the beginning has been to prepare the way of the king. So from, like I said, before the foundation of the earth, Yehovah was king, Yeshua was king, the Son was king over all of what was laid out to come. And as we read in other scripture verses concerning Melchizedek, he said he had no father or mother, no, no genealogy, because he was not born of man like we are. Some try to say that Shem was, was Melchizedek, but it's not because Shem had a father or mother. Shem had genealogy, so that doesn't work. Um, but to go along with this, to see how even in Hebrews it's laid out, Hebrews chapter 7, verses, uh, verses 11 through, what did I put, 11 through 28. Therefore, and, and listen carefully, Mishpaha, listen to what the words are saying here. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, let me remind you, as the Father's prayer, on earth as it is in heaven, okay? So everything was to be established through man on earth to show what is in heaven. What, as we talked about with 
the heavenly priests and kings on our teaching of Malach Yehovah a couple weeks ago. So therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the Torah, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aharon? So if the man-made Levitical priesthood could have been enough, could have established and been perfect, then there would have been no need for the Melchizedek priesthood. But the Melchizedek priesthood, as we know, was a was to first in the physical, then in the spiritual, for us. But what was already established spiritually has been placed in the physical here. So for us, it was first in the physical. We were to receive in the physical what was to bring us to the spiritual that was before the foundation of the earth. Does that make sense? So by bringing us and giving us Levitical priesthood, it was to point to the spiritual priesthood, heavenly priesthood of Melchizedek order. Amen? Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the Torah or of the law. Now, that doesn't mean that the law is done away with. The change is that of the tribe of Levi, that priesthood could not sustain. The change being that the, the Melchizedek priesthood has to come to make perfect and line up. Amen? Verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. The Levitical priesthood officiated everything at the altar of Yehovah in the tabernacle, in the temple. But of the Melchizedek priesthood, it was not officiated by man at the altar. It was officiated by the son of himself. Uh, to himself, for he is the high priest, and by him at the altar of Yehovah, as we see in Revelation that I talked about, uh, I think in last week's message, or in, um, yeah, I think it was last week's message, where Anthony and I talked about the, the altar of Yehovah in heaven, okay? For he of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no man is officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Adon arose from Yehuda, of which tribe Moshe spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet for more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, so not by man, like the, Levi like the Levites, but according to the power of an endless life, which is Yeshua. For he, te <clears throat> excuse me, for he testifies, and this comes from, uh, you find this in Psalm, I want to say 84, I hope, I'm, I, hope I have that right. Um, also uh, other places. Uh, verse 17, for he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Now, people have taken this to be that the former thing, the commandment, is they just turn it into a big thing and declare it to all be the law of Torah. That's not what it's talking about. It is talking about the former commandment that was of the Levites. They lost their place. They lost their high priest status due to their betrayal, their perversion, them not doing what they were supposed to do as the priesthood on earth before Yehovah's throne and altar, before the Holy of Holies and everything. They lost that privilege. Therefore, that former commandment was removed to be replaced by what was not weak, but was profitable and strong. 
For the verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to Elohim, and that is the Melchizedek priesthood. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, Yehovah has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Yeshua has become a surety of, of a better covenant, and that is the Melchizedek priesthood. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Not, they, grew, they grew old and died. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to Elohim through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as though as those high priests to offer up sacrifices. He does not need to make sacrifice and offering for himself. The priest and the high priest always had to do offering of sacrifices for themselves before they could do it for the people because they were in sin as well, because of their fleshly sin. So they had to constantly mikvah and make sure that they were clean and right before Yehovah before they could come in and intercede for the people. But Yeshua never has to do that he, because he is perfect and holy, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Uh, continue verse 27 again. Who does not need daily as, though, as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first, first for his own sins. Okay, just what I just said here. Um, and then for the people, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Last verse here. For the law points as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. So let me explain it. So for the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness. The Torah was given to appoint the Levitical priests and to lay out their order and their job. But the word of the oath, the word, Devarim, but more so the word, Yeshua. The, so, but Yeshua of the oath, because he is the covenant, and by him nothing is established except by the covenant, by the word of the Father, which is Messiah, which came after the law. It doesn't mean this was a new covenant after the law. It means it was brought into place after the law because the law revealed that by man it could not be made perfect. The priesthood could not be perfect. Therefore, it had to be replaced by what was already established before the foundation of the earth. The Levitic or the Melchizedek priesthood, the Son who has been perfected forever. Amen. All right. So, with all of that established and laying out that from the beginning, before the foundation of the earth, he was crucified, and before the foundation of the earth, he was King of Kings, and before the foundation of the earth, he was high priest. And in its order, it had to come and be established. And all of this points to the preparing, prepare the way of the king. All of this, everything, the feast, the moedims, the commandments, the, the Levitical priesthood, everything was to, po to point to the preparing of the way of the king which, which is of old, who has no genealogy and no mother and father, as Scripture says. Amen? All right, so going with that, what else? And what is the example that he gave us to show us? This king, this king of kings, and it's like, it, 
I know it's the word, it's the word king, but it's, it's like this word king doesn't even begin to describe the power and the authority of who he is. It seems like there's, there's, there's got to be such an even more magnified word to describe his omnipotent, awesome glory. And, but what I'm about to share now just shows the graciousness and the, and the greatness of his love and mercy. So, all right, our husband and maker, Isaiah 54, 5, your maker is your husband, Yehovah Elohim, Yehovah Yeshua. He is our husband and our maker. He had to come as the suffering servant first to restore his bride unto himself. As you, those who have followed this, this ministry long enough have heard me talk about how Yeshua divorced Israel because of our idolatry and spiritual adultery, gave her a certificate of divorce, everything. And how through the Torah and scripture, there's only one way that he could take his bride back because he, she had went and made a covenant with another. And as Deuteronomy 4, or 24, verses 1 through 4, talks about, to paraphrase, is if a man divorces a woman, she goes and marries another, and they get divorced and he dies, she cannot come back to her first husband because it is an abomination and will profane the land. As well as Romans 7, 1 through 3, also states that of the law of a woman who's married to a man, that first man, she is bound by him to him by the law until that man dies. And, even, and if she goes and marries another, she is an adulterous woman until that first man dies, then she is released and she's no longer adulterous. So that means that the first husband has to die. That means for Yehovah Yeshua to restore his bride unto himself, he has to die. And so he did. And he gives us this beautiful example of what his true, deep, intimate love is for his, for his bride. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. And I, I love what he says here. That he might present her to himself a glorious and I, I hate this word church. Uh, it's not ecclesia. Ecclesia is not church in Greek. It actually means to congregate, to assemble. It does not mean church. The word church comes from the Latin word circe, which is circle and circus. So I hate the word church. I think it just takes away from this so much. I, my, my personal opinion is it should say bride, but in the Greek it says the assembly the congregation, that he might present her to himself a glorious assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. This is what we're supposed to be. Now listen what, he's, what Paul says here. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I'm sorry, I skipped verse, uh, wait a minute. Uh, that was 28. I missed 26. Sorry about that. 25, 26. I missed both of those verses. I'm reading the numbers wrong. All right, let's try this again. 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah also loved the assembly and gave himself for her. Yah is telling us men to have a love for our wife that we would not think twice, but to sacrifice our very life to deliver our wife out of whatever it is that's needed. That's a pure love. And this is why Yeshua says, there is no greater love than he who is willing to lay down his life for another. Some translations say for a friend. But it's to give your life for another. And how many people, it's a rhetorical question, but how many people would actually take a bullet, step in front of a train, so to speak, a car, go through torture to protect the one they love? 
and for a wife to, to lay down your life. And Yeshua gave that very example. He laid down his life for his bride. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. I want to go back to something here. In uh, Genesis 18, uh, sorry, in Genesis 14, it says that Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of Salem, came out to Abram and gave Abram bread and wine. Think about that for a second. Does that trigger something? What did Yeshua say? I am the bread of life. Come unto me and you will never hunger. Eat of my body, which is the bread. Take of this fruit of the vine, which Yeshua would not drink. He said that he was not to drink of that until the time was. But he said, take of this cup and drink. It is my blood that will make you whole. Right there was one of the first orders of Yeshua, Yehovah Yeshua, showing what he was coming to do, to be the bread that would be broken for our sins, to be the blood, the wine, the fruit of the vine that would be poured out on the earth for our sin, to deliver us. He was already giving us before he even made covenant with Avraham, he was already showing us and pointing us to the king. The king is the one that has the bread and the wine, the king whose table that we sit at or will sit at and eat of his bread and drink of his wine. And all of this points to what has to happen, had to happen to bring to the place where he would leave his throne and come and die for his bride and give up his kingship, but for a moment and make himself lower than the angels and wash the feet of his bride as he did to the disciples and said, by this example, do as I do. Ms. Bahai, have you washed the feet of your wife? And I'm talking to you men. Have you washed your wife's feet? Are you washing her with the word as our king is washing us? Are you making her pure and clean? Because it says, husbands, wash your wives in the word. This is what we are to do, Mishpaha. This is how we prepare the way of the king so that we will be presented unto him spotless and without blemish. And he sanctifies us with the water by the word, and the word is him and the Torah. He is all of that. Amen. So here's a few extra things. Anthony had a couple of verses that he gave me that I really liked that uh, I put in with this. Genesis 18, 1 through 8. This is beautiful. Then Yehovah appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre. As he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Adon, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread 
that you may refresh your hearts after that you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Avraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Avraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Abraham returned unto Yehovah Yeshua and fed Yehovah Yeshua because Yehovah Yeshua as the Melchizedek high priest gave Avraham bread and wine of righteousness and of salvation. And Avraham understood what that meant. And when he saw Yeshua and the angels with him, he fed him to, to bless him as he was blessed. But there's more to that than this, than more to that. And I love uh, the little note that Anthony left me for this. This really speaks a lot. We find Abraham waiting at the door of his tent. This was a nomadic custom in ancient times for the men to do, to wait at the door and keep watch for visitors. Avraham was waiting in hope and expectancy for a visitor to come. He was waiting on Yehovah. That's why he ran to them. The first thing that Avraham did was invite the king into his house. Then he prepares his house by telling Sarah to make the king a meal. Avraham prepared his house for his king. Are we prepared in our house to invite the king in, Mishpaha? Is your house prepared to invite the king in and to feed him? Are we preparing our families, our spouses, to receive the king? Are we doing our diligence, due diligence to our king and getting our home prepared for him to come and visit us so that we can be standing there waiting at the door, eagerly awaiting his arrival so that we could run to him and bow at his feet and usher him in to our home and feed him as he fed us. Amen. Let's go to Job. Job 11. Job 11, 13 through 19. If you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hands toward him, if iniquity were in your hand, and you, and you put it far away and would not let wickedness dwell in your tents, in your homes, in your houses, then surely you could lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and not fear because you would forget your misery and remember it as waters that have passed away and your life would be brighter than noonday. Though you were dark, you would be like the morning, and you would be secure because there is hope. Yes, you would dig around you and take your rest in safety. You would also lie down, and no, no one would make you afraid. Because when we are preparing for the way of the king, and we are walking just as Job talks about, that, the, that there is no iniquity in our homes, that there is no iniquity in our hand that is far from us. If we would let go and get rid of these things in our lives that are even the smallest of things that maybe you think are small and inconsequential, but if it displeases Yehovah, it's very important. And it must be dealt with and it must be put away. Malachi 3, 1 through 4.
Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Yehovah, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says Yehovah Tzfeo. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Then they may offer to Yehovah an offering in righteousness, which they will do in millennial reign. That's in Ezekiel 44 and 45 and 46. Then the offering of Yehuda and Yerushalayim will be pleasant to Yehovah as in the days of old, as in former years because he will restore them back together as one house. And once again, they will be the house of Israel and him as king of kings. So to bring this to a head, we come to John 14. Oh, past it. John 14, one through six. Yeshua said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in Elohim, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may, all be, may be also. And when I go, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Adon, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Yeshua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And last, but surely not least, we come to these two scriptures, Isaiah 49 through 11. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Yerushalayim, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, and be not afraid, say to the cities of Yehuda, behold your El, behold Yehovah Elohim shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him, behold his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And to finish this off is this. Matthew 23, 37 through 39, Yeshua says, O oh, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Baruch Abah, Bashem Yehovah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yehovah. Mishpaha, the only way that we will usher in the king that we keep claiming, Bo Yeshua Bo, come Yeshua come, Maranatha, come quickly. The only way that's going to happen is by us preparing the way of the king, by what we do, what we say, how we live, how we stop living, and how we give our all to him in absolute obedience and surrender so that we can receive the washing of his blood to make us the spotless bride, so that we can be, as Job said to, 
that if we cast away all iniquity away from us and make it far from us, we can boldly lift our head up and look to him and await at the door for our king to come so that we are ready to run and greet him and invite him into our home and so that we can go to the place that he has prepared for us in all eternity. So Mishpaha, do what you need to do. Repent, hit your face and repent. Hazarah by Teshuvah, return in repentance and sin no more and prepare the way of the king, amen? I love you, Mishpaha, but most of all, y'all loves you. Shalom, shalom, Shabbat shalom.